Wherever you find yourself in rural Britain, you can be pretty sure that some novelist or other will have passed by at some stage in the nation's history and immortalised the view as the published word. It could be Jane Austen's Hampshire Hamlets, Charles Dickens' Kent Coast, the Bronte sisters' Yorkshire Dales, D. H. Lawrence's Nottinghamshire Landscapes, or George Eliot's picturesque Warwickshire. But on this occasion, it's the green and pleasant countryside of Dorset that we'll be focusing on. I'm Liam Dale, and I'd like to welcome you to Thomas Hardy's Wessex. For anyone in search of the most perfect example of an English country cottage, Thomas Hardy's birthplace would have to be a major contender in the delightful setting of Higher Bockhampton on the outskirts of Dorchester. It was here on the 2nd of June 1840 that Thomas Hardy made his entry into the world and you only have to look around you to see where so much of his inspiration for the beautiful evocative descriptions of rural life that fill his novels came from. But this is not where our author's story actually begins. And if we travel the short distance to the nearby village of Stinsford, you can see where it all started. Welcome to St Michael's Church, where Jemima Hand, a young maid at Stinsford House, first laid eyes on a musician by the name of Thomas Hardy, who came with his father and uncle to play the violin for the Sunday service. With no organ in many country churches, this was quite a common practice. Despite Jemima's aspirations to better herself, being a keen reader, romance blossomed between the musician and the servant girl. And like many a fair maid in Hardy's later novels, she found herself pregnant. Fortunately for Jemima, the young man was prevailed upon to do the honourable thing, and the couple were married just a few days before Christmas 1839 and moved to the Hardy family cottage at Higher Bockhampton. The Hardys were actually builders by trade, and the cottage had been constructed in the early 1800s from whatever resources could be found. By the time Jemima arrived, the family was presided over by her mother-in-law, Mary Hardy, who would pass on her tales of old country folklore to her grandson. However thwarted Jemima might have felt by her necessary marriage, Thomas Hardy Sr. proved to be a good husband. And a year after the birth of her son, also named Thomas, a daughter, Mary, was born. Ironically, Jemima would warn all of her children never to marry, but she soon turned her attention to ensuring that her new son had every opportunity to better himself through education. As life for the Hardys settled, the frail Tommy, as our author was known, proved to be as intelligent as he was sensitive. Forever losing himself in books, he also developed a keen love of nature and his beautiful surroundings, and when he was eight years old, he was sent to school in Lower Bockhampton, which is to this day the epitome of a classic English village. Young Thomas Hardy was captivated by the Lady of the Manor, who opened the school shortly before his arrival. In fact, he was one of her first pupils. But it was quickly evident that this excellent student was ready to progress beyond what this rural establishment could offer. <laughs> 
Consequently, he was sent to Dorchester at the age of 10 to continue his studies. During his three-mile walk to school, he would cross the stone-arched bridge into the town, leaving the countryside behind as he encountered independence for the first time and the hustle and bustle of urban rather than rural life. Thomas stayed at school until he was 16, by which time the family had increased with the birth of Henry in 1851 and another daughter, Kate. Mr and Mrs Hardy were nonetheless determined to encourage their eldest son to aspire to greatness, and instead of him entering the family building business, he was apprenticed to the Dorchester architects Hicks in South Street, taking his first steps towards professional advancement. Thomas Hardy again excelled, becoming a meticulous draftsman at a time when architects were much in demand as wealthy Victorians made ostentatious additions to their properties. He also found himself called upon to work on the restoration of the fabric of various churches, but as his sharp mind continued to develop, Thomas Hardy began to question the religious doctrine that was preached within. Visitors to Stinsford are delighted to discover the Thomas Hardy Memorial Window, which depicts the author's favourite passage of scripture from the Old Testament, when the prophet Elijah hears the still, small voice of God. However, it was within this very church that the vicar's sermon so incensed young Hardy one Sunday morning that he turned away not only from Stinsford, but also from the Christian faith. The vicar had attacked the lower classes for aspiring to join the professions, just as our author had done, and this caused great offence. Thomas Hardy, for a while, attended other churches, but with bold new ideas circulating, pioneered by Charles Darwin and his theories of natural selection and the origin of the species, the cracks in Hardy's faith began to widen. Also, after six years studying architecture in Dorchester, Hardy looked to broaden his horizons in terms of his career, leaving the county town and the pastoral landscape of Dorset far behind him as he made his way to London in the hope of making his mark on the great city. With a thirst for knowledge, Hardy visited museums and art galleries, went to the theatre, the opera, and even saw the acclaimed novelist Charles Dickens giving a public reading of his works. Being an able architect, he soon found work in Blomfield's offices just off Trafalgar Square. But seeing the contrast between the rich and the poor so dramatically demonstrated on the streets of London, he began to question the validity of his chosen profession. His attention turned to literature, and he began to write poetry, but failed miserably when it came to finding a publisher. And he felt that his lack of a university education and his lower class background had held him back. Disappointed, Hardy's health also began to suffer. And in 1867, he decided to return to the peace and tranquility of Dorset. It didn't take long for Hardy's health to be restored. And he came back to work at Hicks, Yet his London experiences had triggered his imagination, and Hardy started to look towards making his living writing novels as an alternative to architecture. At first he failed again to find a publisher, with his manuscript of Poor Man and a Lady, rejected for being too hostile to the upper classes. Undeterred, he began to pen Desperate Remedies, the story of a lady's maid embroiled in a twisting plot of deception. And then fate took a hand in the life of Thomas Hardy when his architectural duties took him to the church of St. Juliet in Cornwall. When the door of the parsonage was opened by Emma Gifford, the rector's sister-in-law, Hardy looked into the eyes of the girl who would capture his heart. In the wild Cornish landscape, enjoying Emma's company and watching her ride, Hardy was both besotted and inspired. Oh, the opal and the sapphire of that wandering western sea, 
and the woman riding high above with bright hair flapping free, the woman whom I loved so and who loyally loved me. When the time came for Hardy to leave St Juliet's, he returned to hire Bockhampton, but with thoughts of Emma to motivate him, the young author managed to publish Desperate Remedies and began work on Under the Greenwood Tree. There is no doubt that this description of the Dewey's cottage was based upon Hardy's own home. It was a long, low cottage with a hipped roof of thatch, having dormer windows breaking up into the eaves, a chimney standing in the middle of the ridge and another at each end. The plot is also very telling, with the church of Melstock so evidently based on Stinsford at the heart of the tale. Melstock Choir and its musical players are to be replaced by an organ, and this storyline combined with that of Dick Dewey, one of the musicians infatuated with the lovely schoolmistress, are interwoven very deftly with Hardy's own memories of rural life. It was exactly to the taste of the Victorian reading public, and when it was published in 1872, it was a great success. Hardy's thoughts at this time were focused on Emma, so his next work, actually commissioned by his publisher and called A Pair of Blue Eyes, was based on his Cornish romance. At this point in his life, Hardy was 32 years of age. His literary success meant that he could now turn his back on architecture to pursue his writing. What's more, the financial rewards meant that he was now in a position to ask for Emma's hand in marriage something he wasted no time in doing. But if you want to know whether the love of Hardy's life said I do, you'll need to join me again in just a few moments. Sadly, the path of true love failed to run smoothly, and when Thomas Hardy asked Emma's father's permission to marry his daughter, his request was turned down. Again, Hardy's lack of social position had hindered him, but ironically, back here at Higher Bockhampton, his own mother was equally opposed to the match. Nevertheless, Emma and Hardy remained true to each other, and as our author started work on Far From The Madding Crowd, Emma became the inspiration for the vibrantly drawn Bathsheba Everdeen. When the novel was published in 1874, once again readers were delighted by Hardy's portrayal of rural life, and the dramatic events of this tale, complete with a suitably happy ending, made it another great success. On a more personal level too, Hardy was a happy man, as he and Emma married on September the 17th, 1874, despite neither of their families giving their blessings to the match. After sweeping Emma away for a honeymoon in Paris, the newlyweds first settled on the outskirts of London, but as ever, Dorset pulled at Hardy's heartstrings, and they soon moved to Swanage. But despite the wonderful sea views, the sparkle of the Hardy's romance was beginning to lose its luster. The wild, free-spirited girl from Cornwall was somehow dulled by domesticity in her husband's eyes, and his next novel, Ethelberta's Hand, telling the story of a servant's child trying to rise above their station, did not meet with Emma's approval. Over an unsettled period, the Hardys moved a number of times, but eventually they relocated to Sturminster Newton, and life for both Thomas and Emma began to improve. And is it any wonder, here at Riverside Villa, with its wonderful views of the Dorset countryside, Hardy would take Emma on boat trips on the River Stour, and it was as if the first flush of their romance was rekindled. In this happy state, Hardy began work on The Return of the Native, drawing his inspiration from childhood memories of walking with his mother to visit his Aunt Maria across the heath. His descriptions of Dorset are at their most atmospheric and define the genius of Thomas Hardy with true eloquence. Even Hardy talked of this time with Emma as being a two-year idyll, but just as his characters in The Return of the Native failed to live happily ever after, a shadow had fallen across his marriage, 
as the hoped-for conception of a child eluded the Hardys. Thomas became restless, and needing to research his next novel, The Trumpet Major, a move to London was decided upon, but this did little to improve matters between husband and wife. After three years in London, the call of Dorset again pulled Thomas Hardy homeward, and it was to a plot of land on the outskirts of Dorchester that this particular native returned. You see before you Maxgate, the house that Hardy used his architectural skill to design and his family building connections to construct, where he would live for the rest of his life. Inspired by the close proximity of Dorchester, Hardy began to write The Mayor of Casterbridge. But a newspaper article, giving an account of a man selling his wife, also gave our author food for thought and underpins the plot of this remarkable novel. If you wander around Dorchester, Hardy's Casterbridge, you'll find many of the locations, including the house of Michael Henchard, the eponymous mayor, which is now a bank. In his story, Henchard sells his wife Susan and his baby daughter to a sailor. But when they return to find him years later, Hardy reunites them at an amphitheatre from Dorchester's Roman past, known as the Mornbury Rings. In the end, Henchard pays for his misdeeds, dying alone, a broken and bitterly disappointed man it would seem that his creator was also feeling somewhat depressed at this time, if these words from a letter to a friend are anything to go by. You would be quite shocked if I were to tell you how many weeks and months in bygone years I have gone to bed, wishing never to see daylight again. No doubt Hardy's troubled marriage contributed to his sadness, but as at the time he planted a veritable forest of trees around Maxgate, he started work on The Woodlanders, while Emma became even more isolated. Even so, the literary world did offer its compensations. The Hardys would always head to London to do the season, as the author had become something of a celebrity. Also, there were happier moments back at Maxgate, when Hardy and Emma rode around Dorset on their bicycles. And when they travelled abroad, they fulfilled Hardy's dream of visiting Rome to follow in the footsteps of the poets Shelley and Keats. As well as finding the house where Keats died at the foot of the Spanish steps, the Hardys were overcome by the drama of the Forum on Palatine Hill. And when they returned home, our author was ready to tell the whole world his views on what he perceived as the injustices of Victorian society. From his study at Maxgate, Hardy set to work on Tess of the D'Urbervilles, tackling such taboo subjects as rape, illegitimacy and the exploitation of the poor by the upper classes. Now, when it was published in 1891, the plight of country girl Tess was viewed as outrageous, with the novel branded as scandalous. But this did nothing to discourage sales, making Hardy, rather ironically, wealthier than ever, while the rifts in his marriage grew deeper. If Tess of the D'Urbervilles scandalised Victorian society, what followed would shock them even more. When Jude the Obscure, the story of a disappointed village stonemason was published, there was a public outcry, and members of the clergy actually burnt the book as a protest over its subject matter. When Jude's young son hangs first his brother and sister, and then himself, leaving a note saying, done because we are too many, people were horrified. Hardy was dismayed by the strength of feeling against him, and in fact, he slipped back into depression, and from this time onwards poured all his creativity into his poetry, never writing another novel. 
On the domestic front at Maxgate, the novel was equally problematic because Emma had developed an evangelical fervour and was horrified at what her husband had written. Handing Hardy a Bible, she promptly moved out of the marital bedroom and into the attic, which became her sanctuary. With the dawn of the 20th century, a new age dawned, and with the death of Queen Victoria in 1901, the world that Thomas Hardy had rebelled against began to change. As Hardy continued to publish wonderful poems, his novels became even more popular with a more liberated readership, and fans travelled to Dorset to see the dramatic locations immortalised in his great works. People wrote to Hardy from all over the world, and when a young teacher by the name of Florence Dugdale asked if she could visit him in 1905, a new chapter began for the now famous writer. A relationship developed between the unlikely pair, with Florence calling herself Hardy's secretary. But when the unhappy Emma died in 1912, Florence was keen to take her place. Emma Hardy was buried in Stinsford Churchyard. Despite the difficulties experienced during 38 years of marriage, Hardy was overwhelmed by his memories and the poems that followed commemorated the beautiful wild girl he had fallen in love with all those years earlier. Nevertheless, Thomas Hardy married Florence in the February of 1914, as the storm clouds of World War I gathered, and Hardy lived out his days at Maxgate, continuing to write his stunning poetry. It was only failing health that stopped him writing in the end, and after a month of illness, he died from a heart attack on the 11th of January, 1928. And so we come full circle, back to Stinsford Church, where Jemima Hand first took a fancy to the musical Thomas Hardy Sr. all those years earlier. But it's only the heart of our great author buried here in this grave. This is because his London friends believed Thomas Hardy should be buried in Westminster Abbey's Poets' Corner, this is where the rest of his mortal remains were interned, alongside the great and the good of English literature. As a final note, it's worth mentioning that you can distinguish between the graves of Thomas Hardy Senior and Junior by the letters OM after our author's name. King George V bestowed the Order of Merit on Thomas Hardy in 1910, and for a man who all his life felt at a disadvantage because of his poor rural background, he achieved great things. And ironically, it was his memories of the salt-of-the-earth farming folk and the simple joys of country life that made his rise to fame and fortune possible.